Hello, everyone, and welcome to Choose FI. Today, a little bit of a different type of episode. We're trying a uh, little bit of an experiment here where it's an interactive show, and uh, we are doing this for the next several weeks using an app called Stereo. For more information or to join us on the next live event, you can just go to choosefi.com slash live. Uh, it is going to be taking place uh, Tuesday at 7.30 uh, p.m. Eastern time. And again, if you would like to join us and participate in these live events, just go to chooseify.com slash live. And the reason is that this is the ultimate crowdsource personal finance show. Welcome to Chooseify. All right, guys, diving into it. We're running our uh, first, really our first trial of this 10 week uh, series and t tonight's episode and maybe what we'll kind of come back to a couple times is what's stopping you from reaching financial independence? What's stopping you from reaching financial independence? And uh, for people, longtime listeners of this show, you know that financial independence is this idea that you can get to the point where working is optional. But I thought maybe before we do this live event and we take some of these questions, uh, we just start by kind of breaking that down a little bit further. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, this should be this should be a lot of fun. We've always wanted to do kind of like a live radio show. So this is a, a neat way to be able to do this. Uh, you know, we talked about it, as you said, as this crowdsource personal finance show. So uh, we have people listen live and they get to send in their little voice messages. We get to riff off them. So this is really about just having the community be involved and the side benefit is then we're recording this also for the Friday roundup. So yeah, it looks like the next uh, 10 of these Friday roundups we're going to do with these live events. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited, a little bit nervous, but, but I'm uh, mostly excited here. All right. With that, uh, this is our first live event and I suspect there will be just a couple car crashes involved. So I hope you enjoy it as a full and very entertaining event. Uh, let's go ahead and kick this thing off. Uh, yes, I can definitely hear you, Brad. I am not hearing your amazing microphone. Uh, I am hearing your um, your cell phone, which is great, which would be fine, except I was going to try and capture your audio on the back end for the podcast because this is the Choose a Fi podcast, and our podcast goes live every Monday and Friday, so we were trying to have a backup copy for that. And I don't know if you want to just see if you can get that reconnected. Take your time. While you're doing that, I just want a huge shout out to everybody that has joined us here. I know uh, there's 35 of you on right now. This is our first live event that we've done. The goal was, would it be possible for us to recreate kind of a, uh, a you know, a radio show on demand, one that we could, uh, you know, I don't want to set up a phone number that you could call in. I kind of like the whole podcast feel, but is there a way that you could, you know, interact with us, submit your voicemails? And in fact, the the context for today's conversation is, What's stopping you? What's stopping you from reaching financial independence? Maybe you uh, found our show within the last couple of years. Maybe you've been with us since the beginning. And, uh, you know, you keep waiting for that episode. Uh, that one episode's going to have that piece of information that uh, you've been looking for. And uh, we just have not delivered. And so you keep waiting. And I was like, that, that can't be the most efficient way to go about doing this. What if we could just make it interactive? So just join us on the show. And either if you're prompted with a question because you feel like we missed something uh, on our Monday interview, or maybe you've just been looking around for an answer, just join us on our interactive live and ask your question. Let's figure out what is it that's stopping you from reaching financial independence. Uh, so Brad, how are we looking, man? All right. So while we're waiting on that, uh, financial independence, stopping you from reaching financial independence, let's uh, dial this up a notch. What is uh, financial independence? Now, those of you that are coming and following us from our podcast, you know, I know you know this, but let's assume that maybe swiped right, swiped left, stumbled on the show and they, uh, and you got that question as well. What would it look like to just simply get to the point where working is optional, right? Get to the point where if you choose to work, it's not because you're doing it out of fear on how you're going to pay the bills or, uh, you know, reaching some corporation's goals. It's based on your own goals, your own drive. It's not to say that you walk away and you drink pina coladas and you never do anything else again, but you recognize that time is your most precious non-renewable resource. And uh, you want to prioritize your life around that reality. So we do have someone waiting to talk and we're going to uh, start doing voicemails. There's a voicemail feature where you can just submit any questions that you have about that concept, that idea. You can uh, drop a question related to that. 
Uh, give me just one more second here. Brad, how's it going, man? Okay, well, with that in mind, we'll go ahead and play our first. I think we got our first voicemail. Brad, do you want to go ahead and pull that up and air it? And uh, then we'll re respond to that. And then we'll go a little bit farther with this conversation. Uh, what is stopping you from reaching financial independence? And maybe more importantly for new people, what is financial independence? And how do you, how, just generally, how do you reach it? All right. So I got a, Jonathan, I got a call here. Awesome. All right. So Lorena has a question All here. Right. She's got $6,000 in savings and she's just trying to figure out how to allocate that. And Brad, I think if we were to dive into that, we have, she wants to know, should I invest 50% in M1 and VT and VTI or VTSAX? Just kind of wondering what allocation there. And I think, I think Brad, both of us would take the position as obviously it depends. I know throwaway, right? But like, what are your goals and what is your timeline? The thing about the financial independence community is we don't typically think about, all right, hey, you're approaching 65 or hey, you're, you're 21. It's more like, what is your general timeline and what, what is the time at which you're going to need this money or anticipate needing this money? And that would really drive uh, a lot of the conversation as it would come to allocation. Yeah, I think, like you said, a lot of this is going to come down to where you are, what your exact situation is, your comfort level, right? It sounds, Lorena, like you are, you are comfortable, you're, you've got this money saved up, you're ready to invest, you probably have listened to our podcast, you, I'm sure, have you know, listened to other, other shows and, and have a sense of, okay, Clearly I'm saving money, right? I can move forward. I'm not paycheck to paycheck. Things are good. I'm saving for the long term. I think that's that's the real important aspect of this. And I think most of us don't know a lot about investing and we think about it as as a short term game. And I think that is the fundamental misunderstanding of what we're doing here. We are playing long term games. That's, that's pretty much what we in the FI community are doing. We're playing long-term games every time we can. So if this is money that you feel comfortable investing, hopefully for 10, 20, 30 plus years, and you're not going to freak out when the market inevitably and invariably has a correction, goes down 10%, goes down 20%, like that is going to happen sometime, multiple times in the next one, three, five, 10, 20 years. It's just going to happen. But we genuinely believe based on past performance and where we've seen the US and world economies go that over the long term, this is going to give us the highest likelihood of success. That's how I look at investing in a total stock market index fund or, or some similar index fund. So I think of it as a long term game. And I'm comfortable putting that money in week after week, month after month, year after year. But the, the real important caveat, and this is where you have to know yourself, if this is really critical money to you that you want to just put away, like you need to have some type of emergency fund for, for yourself. Hey, I need to sleep well at night to have $5,000 saved away and just in a savings account, nothing's going to happen to it. All right, then maybe you only consider putting that next thousand. You said you had 6,000 total into the stock market. And then as you continue savings, then you put that additional money in, right? So Jonathan, that's kind of how I conceptualize it. It's like, it really is going to depend on, on her personal situation. Right. So the question is, uh, where do I put this money, you know, and what should my, my allocation be? Uh, so, you know, the M1 platform that she mentioned, we've talked about this. It's, it's probably my favorite, uh, I guess you would say smart advisor, like rule-based advisor for investing money. Maybe competitors in the space would be things like, um, Robin hood or uh, Wealthfront or what's another one betterment. I think these are all the, the ones that are in this space. They just make it very easy to invest your money uh, into, uh, and, and in one's case, pretty much any ETF, any ETF is accessible on there. And in terms of your actual allocation, to your point, Brad, there's at least two factors that are the primary drivers for coming up with what your number is. And, and in my mind, it is how soon do you need this money? And what is your risk tolerance, the balance between those two? Uh, and so, you know, the other thing that you could look at is like what's going on behind the scenes, like your current net worth, 
uh, your flexibility, your job security, uh, your, do you have an emergency fund in place? Kind of like your general, like what, it, what are the other things that define your financial picture? Because if your emergency fund is in place, if your timeline is long, if your risk tolerance is relatively high. And what I mean by that is go back to March. How scared were you in March of 2020? That is a, that is a, a massive indicator of what your risk tolerance actually was. If you were losing sleep when we saw a 30% drop, which we did over a period of a month or two, then you do not want to do things with your money that will make you lose sleep at night, right? I, um, I have long been pretty much 100% uh, allocated towards equities, 100% allocated towards just, you know, like VTSAX go all in. In March of this year, of last year, I realized, despite knowing all the other situations, despite knowing my net worth, despite having a pretty solid emergency fund, despite have, being able to earn income several different ways, um, I didn't like the feeling of knowing that I didn't have any dry powder when the market uh, was going down in March of last year. And so I learned something about myself and I sat down with my wife and we kind of analyzed our, our emergency fund because it's going to happen again. We're going to have another scenario. We don't know when, but at some point in time, you're going to have another scenario. Maybe it's not as bad. Maybe it's worse. And you're going to have to deal again with those 30% drops, 40% drops, something like that. If that were to happen and you were to have, let's say you were to just have a million dollars and you were to watch that over a period of a month, two months, or a year go to $600,000, how are you going to be confident in your plan? Or are you going to freak out and pull everything out at the market down at the bottom? which is what many, many people have done. And so you need to um, find a, a allocation that allows you to sleep at night, be confident in your plan, and most importantly, and this is it, do not sell at the bottom. And it's hard to know. I mean, usually you don't know what the bottom is until it's on the way back up. Uh, but you got to stay the course. That's the guiding light on this thing. And your allocation should reflect your ability to stay the course. Yeah, and I think it... First, as just a, a little side note disclaimer, obviously, Jonathan, this is, you know, we don't know anyone's situation. We're not giving particular financial advice. Of course, this is for entertainment, but, you know, this is how we would think through it in our own lives. And I think that's that's what we try to do here. I think everybody who listens to the show understands that. But, you know, you always have to do the research. You have to figure out there's so many things in each individual person's situation in life that are going to you know, really make a difference in, in how they make a decision. But I guess, you know, my, my kind of last thought on this is just get invested. That that's really like, don't get hung up on where is the perfect place. I think what we're, what we espouse here at choose of I is low costs, broad index funds, total stock market index funds, S and P 500, keep your expenses low. That's something that you can control and it makes a massive difference over an investing lifetime. So don't get too hung up. Certainly M1 Finance is great. Vanguard is great. Fidelity, Schwab, there are all these places that you can invest for really $0 in, in account fees, setup fees, et cetera. So that's kind of how I, the advice I give to people is, is don't get hung up on that. I think any of the ones that that I mentioned, I personally have investments at all at all of those places. So they are places that I feel comfortable keeping my money. Now, Brad, I think for people that are finding this, like what are the what are what are the levers that we have access to to be able to reach, you know, financial independence? Because there's so many people that are just literally trying to make it to the next pay period so they can afford the, you know, they can make the minimum payment on the credit card that the idea of getting to the point where working is actually optional just seems like it's it's a foreign concept. Yeah, I think uh, I I think it's largely because there's just no education when it comes to when it comes to personal finance. You know, we we have all heard these things in the media, right? Like maybe someday I can retire. Maybe if I'm lucky when I'm 70, right? Like maybe maybe maybe. And it always seems like it's it's up to somebody else. It's up to some other, some other forces. It's up to society. It's up to luck. And I think the real beautiful part about FI and about our community is that we have taken this and made, made it about our ability to impact change on the world and on our own lives and on our communities, right? Like that is just a really empowering mindset 
And I think people see that when they take small actions day after day, that they can actually make their lives better. And it becomes this just amazing positive feedback loop that when you see something happen that's good, you you look for other places. How can I make this one little change? Where where else can I optimize? What else can I do that's going to save me money and my life will not get any worse, right? Like that's the real secret of all of this is that you make these changes and you think, oh, this is going to be horrible, right? Like, oh, I, I'm, you know, this is how you come in beforehand. Like I, it's going to be deprivation. I'm going to be miserable. I'm going to miss all of those things I used to spend money on. And the real secret is you don't miss any of them. I feel like I live this life of abundance, like this amazing life of abundance. And yet I save a huge percentage of my income. You know, when I was working, Jonathan, I, I saved 50 to 75% of my income living the same middle or even upper middle class life as everybody else. And I mean, that is just, it's an amazing thing, but it's so, it's so foreign if you haven't heard of this concept before. Do you think there's like an income that you need to make here in the United States in order to be able to reach financial independence? Brad, like, I mean, just like, is this, I, you know, like for you guys, did, were you guys making six figures, multiple six figures? Do you think that everybody that's making financial independence is all, you know, six figure people? Like, is there some sort of floor threshold at which point this really isn't for you? I mean, I don't think, I don't think there's a threshold where this message would not be valuable. I think that's how I look at it is that no matter who you are, where you're coming from, no matter what mistakes you've made in the past, no matter what debt you're coming, coming in with, when you find this message, you can take action to make your life better. And again, like, I don't, I don't mean to sound like a, a broken record here or kind of evade your question. I'm, I'm really, I genuinely am not evading your question. It's, I think this message is applicable to anybody. Now, Am I stupid or naive enough to think that this is going to be as easy for someone making minimum wage as it is for someone making $300,000 a year? No, obviously not. There, there is no question about that, but can anybody make their life better if they're living paycheck to paycheck and they can find that first $1,000 to save up and put in their bank account? I mean, I think that person's life is going to be dramatically altered for the better. Are they at financial independence? No, they're obviously not. But the amount of stress that is reduced that first time, and again, no matter where, where you're coming from, when you're not living paycheck to paycheck and you can save that first one or $2,000, your life is so much better. You know, I mean, Jonathan, you're not at financial independence, right? Like the, that's, you're on the path to FI and your life is dramatically better than it was four or five years ago when I met you. That's a good point. I wish you, I would like to come back to that and uh, discuss, uh, you know, kind of that idea of phi even along the way. Uh, Cause my life is phi is really phi. I live a very phi life and um, my bank account doesn't really need to have any number in it to, to feel good about that. But um yeah, I, th I think there is something about to be said for having your, your cake and eating it too. But, but going back to that initial bit, like, is there a threshold? What I've always hated about that, you know, that, that idea is that it assumes that wherever you are is wherever you will be. Like you have no control over uh, both sides of the equation. The equation, what is, well, it's the equation of life. No one ever told you about that? The secret equation? You didn't know, you didn't know about that? We can, we can change all this, right? I mean, it's really, it is, it is, it is empowering to realize that there's, rule, there's rules to this game. And if you understand the rules, uh, it makes it a lot easier to win. I mean, that's like, a, that's, Anybody that's ever played a board game will tell you it's really hard to win if you don't know the rules unless you're in an episode of Friends and Chandler's trying to hand you some money. It's just, that's it. Um, what you earn minus, this isn't even, this is not algebra. What you earn minus what you spend, all right, is equal to some difference. So if there is no difference or if it's negative, that's not good. It's suboptimal. Uh, for many people, it's zero, right? Ideally, there is some amount of a gap there, some difference. And the goal is, how can we expand the gap to give us more options? Which is why the FI community doesn't put all their emphasis on, but I'm not saying none, doesn't put all their emphasis on just 
uh, go and make a ton of money because there's a ton of people that make a ton of money that are paycheck to paycheck. Uh, and they are, they, 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 they've just forgotten that this equation is important. And what you're actually trying to do is grow the gap. Uh, for many reasons, it's usually more effective to start with uh, the expenses just because it's literally, I mean, I think I've, I, I think we thought of like five advantages that we could circle back to. It's, it's worth it to start with the expenses and see what you can trim there, but it's not your only option. And we used to talk about this kind of like as a, you know, intellectual exercise. Well, of course you could create the income, but I remember back in the day, the idea of increasing your income was always like, there were two options. Oh, you can go back to school and get another degree. And everybody knows like, you know, that the, the, the stereotype of where that ends up, it's another two to three years. It's another tens of thousands, $20,000 commitment plus. Um, it's multiple years to then get on this new track to make up for maybe the, how the first one didn't land the right way. And the second option was the Dave Ramsey go deliver pizzas, have a yard sale. And it, none of, neither of, well, either of those might be okay for like a, you know, a one or a two, like that might work for a one week, two week, one month sprint. It doesn't feel, it feels like there has to be a more optimized way for people that are intentionally looking for ways to massively increase their income in a relatively short period of time with ROI and timeline in mind. And I was, I didn't want to keep going <laughs> and <laughs> leave the, uh, the nice pregnant pause there. I like it. No, but I mean, that's something that, you know, again, we, we've talked about on recent episodes about if I could turn back time, right? Like what would I like to have known if this was four or five, 10 years ago? And for me, negotiating salary is one of those blind spots that I I think about an instance where like I, I took the job ultimately that, that I wound up with when I was, I was there for 12 years to the end of my career. And I just failed miserably when it came to, Hey, what did you make at your, what are you looking to earn? What did you make at your prior job? Like I had nothing. I mean, I was just a fool in essence. And if I had been listening to this podcast, so we had Tori Dunlap on episode 147 and we had Jessica, the financial mechanic on episode 211. Yeah, 211. So you can find those by going to obviously on your podcast player or just chooseify.com slash 147 or slash 211. And they gave us these really amazing, really almost scripts of how to get a win-win situation and earn more money. And for me, Jonathan, like I said, that was a complete blind spot, a complete failure that I don't think I even conceptualized it as a failure at that time because, you know, I wound up getting a raise over my prior job, but I was then locked in on that salary for really that salary path forever. Because once you're in a big corporation, in most cases, you're just going to get the, the normal one, two, three, four percent if you're lucky, like cost of living adjustment or whatever they call it, you know, just a little bit of inflation. So I was locked in because I didn't want to leave that company. That's where you normally get those big jumps. But I mean, they gave us this set of tools that taught us how to negotiate. And I thought that was that was a real blind spot. And it was a limiting belief on my part, frankly. Yeah, I, salary negotiation is a, is a massive. I mean, you got to recognize what industry you're in, but it is absolutely, um, there are people in every industry that are doing this and there are those that aren't and the ones that are, are probably over their working lifetime going to make about a million dollars more uh, just because they kind of have this skill. And when you start stacking up, you know, three to 8% annual raises versus their counterparts that are getting one to two because they just are following the rules, uh, that compounds, you know, that, that, that compounds massively. Uh, so just having a few of those strategies and talking about turn back time for me on, on the, on the income side of things, I remember my search in 1999 was something like, you know, top 10 paying professions. And I legitimately kind of just picked one on the list. And my point there is, yeah, I know it sounds so dumb. I wish I could say it wasn't true. Uh, <laughs> you've said, you've told us this story so many times. I'm like, Sometimes I wonder, is it actually, was it true? You actually <laughs> did that. Just, it's, 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 I mean, I, I, looked for, I looked for confirmation outside the list to see if this was the right, but yeah, I kind of just, I just went for it. So I was going to pharmacy. Uh, by the time that I was in the role of pharmacy, uh, it was not roses like 13 years later. Uh, and actually that's kind of my point. 
ask a better question, get a better answer. And uh, know where to look is kind of part two of that. So I just repeated that search now. And my the search this time was top 10 highest paying professions in 2021. And I ended up here, here are the ones I heard. Uh, senior corporate counsel, $175,000. Psychiatrist, $218,000. Hospitalist, 220 general physician, pathologist, medical director, surgeon. And it's, you know, you, there's a pattern here. That's a great question. So your question was, how do I make six figures or multiple six figures? Or what jobs pay? That was your original question. What what are the highest paying professions? And you landed on a bunch of, um, you know, medical doctors in various, in various niches. And, you know, then what should come to mind right away, though, is, all right, if, if you were to pick off that list like I just did, you know, eyes wide open here, uh, to become even a primary care physician minimum, you're looking at seven years plus undergrad, which would take you to 10. You know, most doctors, it's a, from the time they graduate high school, it's a 13, 14 year path till they're making those massive paydays. And when you add that what they borrowed in student loan debt and the compounding interest, they have close to a half million dollars dedicated to, to getting that. It's not, it's, I mean, you better do it for the passion, for the joy of it. If, if, the, if you were trying to get a high paying career, uh, it's not something that, it's just not, the ROI is not the same. And it isn't, it is a long, long stint to get there. When I, when I think about that question now through the lens of somebody that's saying, I make a minimum wage of $15 an hour and, you know, I'm trying to massively improve myself and I don't know if there's like negotiation is something that I can seriously lever at this point in time. Um, you know, if I get 3% on $15 an hour, great. I'm up to maybe, you know, high end $16. Um, I need to move out of my industry, but I don't have the skills to do that. And that's kind of the ghost points to the stuck part, right? Um, there are, we are living in an amazing time where it is no longer the degree. It is the certificate program. It's the proof of skills that can unlock for you literally in a period of months can unlock for you jobs that are paying 60 to $80,000 a year, all the way up to a hundred thousand dollars. Uh, that is, I have proven that out. We've seen that now in our community and what, and it was really, I just want to highlight it was because it was because this community exists and this conversation was fostered. Tell us what you're doing. We know that if we have a community of people that are optimizing everything, they figured something out that we, Brad and I don't know yet. What is it that you were doing? Always extending the invitation and then vetting that information for, is this replicable? Are you an outlier? And it turns out that with what we're describing and, and what we can save that for another time, unless you guys are really interested, we'll actually point you to an episode that we just did on this so you can find out more. But that's not really the point. The point is to say, if you're making $15 an hour, but you were able to figure out how to use this stereo app. And when we drop the first call, go over to the second call, you know, you can handle that level of competency on your phone or on your computer. That already tells me you're the type of person that could land one of these certificate programs and you could be making 60 to $80,000 a year. And as little as six months from now. Right. And so the people that want to tell you that this isn't for you, that you couldn't possibly do this, are the ones that are saying your current status in life is a fixed picture. You have no agency, nothing you can do really matters to which I say BS, total BS. And you, you found the community of people that genuinely care. They're putting this information together so because they've won from it and they want others to know about it and it works, but it only works if you take action. So we've talked about salary negotiation for many of you. We know people that hurt and that's, a, that's the challenge to our community. Are you taking action? These are great ideas, but they work, but only if you take action, people in our community, listen to those episodes, took the strategies to their employer within a week of that episode, we had like three or four people messaging us, telling us they had negotiated between them combined 60 to $70,000 a year in, you know, increases in pay in aggregate. This is money that before they heard that before they took action was just sitting there not being asked for. It makes a difference. Yeah, I totally, totally agree. And yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of how we conceptualize this episode is, is what's stopping you from reaching Phi, right? Like what are those limiting beliefs? And I think for a lot of people, you know, they, they hear this concept and, you know, they just, they have questions, right? Like, and it might be something technical. Like we actually had this, this email come in a little ways uh, ago from Matthew. And, you know, he said, I'm so glad I came across this podcast. I love the clear and objective message and the actionable, the actionable advice each episode. I've been listening for the past six months or so. I also took the FI 101 course and enjoyed it. And then he said, 
I have this question that has been puzzling me regarding financial independence. How do you retire early if you cannot touch retirement accounts until you reach age 59 and a half? Are people taking distributions and paying income taxes and penalties or investing in taxable accounts and making distributions from those instead? Real estate income, dividends. And then he says, next, is it possible to achieve FI only by having retirement accounts, basically? So, I mean, Jonathan, that is just a series of incredible questions. And it's, it's around this larger issue of, okay, I hear, I hear what you're saying. I really do. But there's still just this huge glaring hole for me of like, how am I going to access this money if you're telling me to load up on my 401ks and IRAs that I theoretically can't touch until I'm 59 and a half? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a great question and hopefully we'll give you at least the beginning of a great answer on this one. And um, it's like threefold. There's three different ways to look at this. Uh, the first one and the most obvious one is that early retirement or getting to financial independence early almost by definition. Well, it does. It absolutely encompasses regular retirement. So you're going to need money now and you're going to need money later. And since we know we're going to need money later, let's go ahead and fill up all the buckets where we can make sure the money starts working for us uh, you know, as much as possible. So the way taxes work is you earn the money, the government gets their percentage, and then you get the remainder unless you take advantage of buckets or, uh, or you know, advantage vehicles that will allow you to get around that. And so the we always try to max out our 401ks, especially as we start getting in these higher marginal tax brackets. Brad's an accountant, so I'll let him come back to that definition as a terms. But as the government starts taking a higher uh, percentage, we, it, we have more of an incentive to uh, hide that or shelter that from taxes. And then as you layer on to this, there are, in fact, strategies. And, and I'll give this back to Brad specifically. There are, in fact, strategies if you wanted to. And if you can create enough space, going back to that gap, if you can create enough space between your income and your expenses, there are strategies to be able to get access to that money in a way where it goes in tax-free, it grows tax-free. And with this strategy, which I'll give back to Brad, you can actually draw it out tax-free ahead of that uh, that traditional retirement age. It's just a triple whammy. It's beautiful. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for that, Jonathan. I, I did want to mention, yeah, I love uh, the terminology of, putting money into a 401k is hiding for taxes. <laughs> I heard that in my, uh, my CPA's brain was like, Oh no, that's not, that's not exactly what we're looking to get across here. But, but no jokes aside, like the clearly putting money into your, into your retirement accounts and getting the tax deduction, as Jonathan said, is, is an extraordinarily powerful tool. I think that's why we really highly advocate trying to max out your 401k and traditional IRAs, 403Bs, 457s if you have if you're a public employee because what that does is it gives you certainty when it comes to your taxation, right? It gives you the tax deduction in this current year. And you know at, at this point you're in a prop more likely than not you're earning more money now than you will in some retirement age, whether that's early retirement or a traditional retirement, when you will be making very, very little. And therefore, as Jonathan said, your marginal tax bracket, which is what the next dollar of income is taxed at. So basically we have these tax brackets and as you earn, as you earn more money, those neck, it's always that next dollar. It's that marginal dollar. This is how you need to think about it. So when people say, Oh, I'm in the, 32% tax bracket, that doesn't mean every single one of your dollars is taxed at 32%. That's just not the way the US taxation works. It's not the way the tax code works. So what happens is you can Google just really simply federal tax brackets 2021, and you'll see for single or married filing joint or whatever it is, the first X number of dollars, let's say the first $10,000 is taxed at 10%. And then the next X number of dollars is taxed at 12%. And it, it keeps going like that. So that's how you need to conceptualize the, the taxation system. It's really, really important that you understand that. So basically what happens is when you put money into a retirement account that gives you a current tax deduction, like again, those, those accounts that I mentioned before, 401k being the most, the most common is the taxable, your taxable income is lowered right off the top at that highest bracket by whatever amount you put into that account. So that's why 
that's a really, really powerful, powerful way to lower your taxable income now. So anyway, that's a very, very long, uh, long preamble, Jonathan, to your question, which is what is this strategy that you mentioned, which is really, it's kind of like the ultimately the, the holy grail of what we're doing in the FI community. This is like the best case scenario if you could map this out. So it's called the Roth And, and Brett, I'm going to actually, I'll, I'll let you say it. I'm sorry, I'll let you say it out loud. But I would say, I would say the IRS did hide this strategy inside of 8,100 <laughs> pages <laughs> of the IRS tax code. They definitely buried it. But it is 100% legal. It is all there. Yeah, no question about it. This is just, it's such a niche strategy that really almost only going to be applicable to people in our community, but there's, there's nothing secret here. It, these are just following the rules. It's just according to what we're doing, right? Like we are living this kind of countercultural life of saving money, right? Like that shouldn't be too countercultural, but, but yet it is. And that puts us into advantageous positions when it comes to certain things. And, and this is the perfect case in point. So it's called the Roth IRA conversion ladder. And Jonathan, we've talked about this on a couple of episodes going way, way, way back right into like the teens on our, you know, 400 plus episodes ago. But in essence, this is answering Matthew's question of how do you access this money early? So basically what you're able to do is let's say you have, you have a vast majority of your net worth in your 401k. Okay. So you are, let's say it, it doesn't ultimately matter. You're 40 years old and you've reached financial independence according to, according to, you know, your research and the 4% rule of thumb and, you know, whatever metric you use to decide that you've reached FI. So now you have most of your net worth in this 401k, but you do have some money saved up certainly in your taxable accounts, your regular checking savings, you know, brokerage accounts at wherever you have it. These are not under any of these umbrellas, right? So that makes sense, right? It's just like a starting point. Yeah. All right. So basically at that point, you basically say, all right, I am not going to be working anymore. I'm not going to be earning an income. So that's kind of in our little example here, we're going to say, all right, you're earning $0. You've, you've retired early. Okay. So you're taxable income. Let's say you did this on January 1st of 2021. So your taxable income for 2021 would be $0. Okay. Now what you're able to do is you're able to convert. It's actually called a conversion. Again, the Roth IRA conversion ladder. You're able to pull some money out of your 401k and convert it to a Roth IRA. Okay. Now a Roth IRA has a different type of character than a 401k. So a 401k, you get the tax deduction up front. And then when you pull the money out, you have to pay taxes on it. It's a taxable event. But now you are forcing this taxable event in the current year and putting the money into the Roth because a Roth is an after tax account. Okay. So that's money you've been taxed on and then it grows tax-free and you can pull it out tax-free down the road. That's the beauty of a Roth. So, and to pause on that, just, yeah, just for, just for emphasis here, uh, it's what you just described is you're incurring a taxable event. You're saying government tax me, but the year that you're doing it in is a low income year for you. And so remember how we discussed those marginal tax brackets, you're falling inside those parameters. And so all the government is taxing you, but it's at the lowest marginal tax rate. Brad, am I, am I on point up to the, up to here? Yeah, no, you're exactly right. So, you know, we're in this kind of hypothetical example, we're saying that you have $0 of income in 2021, right? You are saying, I want to create this Roth IRA conversion ladder. So my, let's just say hypothetically, your expenses are $40,000 a year. Okay. So, you know, basically you need $40,000 to, to cover your entire year's worth of expenses. So what you're able to do is you are able to pull out $40,000 from your 401k in a conversion to your Roth IRA. Okay. Now that entire $40,000 is a taxable event, but again, you're starting at a $0 of federal taxable income. So now your taxable income is just 40. Okay. 
So now what's interesting is let's say you are married filing joint and you get a standard deduction somewhere in the vicinity of $25,000. So that comes right off the top and your taxable income now is only $15,000 because you had that 40,000 that's taxable income. You get the deduction for 25,000 and your taxable income is only 15. And now that's applied against the lowest tax rate. So your tax rate is only 10% on that. So actually you're only paying $1,500 in federal tax on pulling that $40,000 out and putting it into a Roth IRA. Now that Roth IRA can grow again, tax-free Jonathan. And now this is kind of where we're setting up this ladder. So you're going to do that every single year. You're going to make that $40,000 conversion. And the reason why you have to do it in this way is that you actually can't access those, that money that's converted for five years. So we'll talk about how you get through those first five years. But in essence, what you're doing is on January 1st, 2021, you're setting up this first year of ladder that you can access five years down the road. And then a year from now, you're doing another conversion that you can access, you know, six years from now, et cetera. So you're doing that over and over again. And what you're doing is you're ultimately pulling out all of your money from your 401k and paying a tiny, tiny, tiny little tax rate on it. Like I said, you're paying about $1,500 in tax on $40,000, which is just a little bit more than 3%, right? So imagine being able to pull all of your money out of your 401k at a 3% effective tax rate. That is a remarkable, remarkable thing. And probably the single biggest hack, potential hack in the FI community. Yeah, and I think it's just nice to know, like if that's what gets you to, because so many people use the excuse of, you know, well, I don't want to have my money tied up till I'm 59 and a half. And I just think like, and I think if you just know that this is there, that's what gets you to start doing it. It's already won, right? It, it, you've already kind of won. Because along the way, we're going to tackle this eight ways from Sunday. I mean, you're not going to just focus on this. You're going to focus on increasing your income and you're going to focus on how can I start, you know, once I've maxed out my 401ks, how can I start investing in other vehicles? It's just nice to know that that money is not trapped there and you don't have to be worried about a penalty you know, if you try to access it early, there's other rules that you'll start to become aware of that move that timeline down. We say the penalty is 59 and a half. In reality, there's something called the rule of 55. We've already moved, taken four years off. I know a lot of people that are planning on doing work until they're 55. And in that case, if all of your money is with your current, uh, is with your current employer's 401k or whatever money is in your employer's 401k, you can put in, you can take advantage of something called the rule of 55. It's in the IRS tax code and you can access all of that money that's in your employer's 401k without penalty ahead of the 59 and a half uh, under the rule of 55. Again, without that 10% penalty, it's just yet another that's option uh, that is there. And you know, I think there are, there are other, there are other, there's just, it's important to have the mindset that we don't know how, what our life circumstance is going to be and exactly when we're going to need it, but we are going to need it. And, but you know, if you wait 20 years to get started because you wanted to have a little bit more of a sense for when your retirement number, you know, what it is and where you've already, you could have already been done. You could have already, you know, you, this is not you, you if you start now, even if you have debt, if you put your mind to this, you could be on easily a 20 year path to financial independence. If you wait 20 years to get serious about this, then the clock's starting then. Why, why wait? Start, just start. Yeah, agreed. And Jonathan, I just wanted to mention for the audience, if anybody's interested in learning more about that, that IRA conversion ladder, the Roth IRA conversion ladder, just head to choosefi.com slash ladder. And there's a, a whole article here that walks you through step by step. Obviously, we did not go through every single aspect of this. But yeah, this is a really, really cool thing. So all right, Jonathan, I think we should, uh, I think I'm going to brave trying to play a voicemail here. We'll see. Hopefully I don't, uh, screw up the whole, <laughs> the no, whole I think, I think, you'll be, I think you'll be fine. Let me close one more loop for people. Uh, cause I also mentioned earlier, we were talking about if you wanted to increase your income and find out about a certificate program, there are a lot of certificate programs out there. In fact, Google just mentioned that they are creating a whole portfolio of these certificate programs. And so you could just 
search for Google certificates. We uh, actually did pilot a program and we have a, uh, a free five day challenge for people that are interested in exploring that. You could, for more information, you can find out all about this opportunity that's out there in Salesforce. It's incredible. We talked about it this past week, episode 297 with Anita, landed a six figure job in a new industry within about a period of four to six months coming from a hospitality industry to effectively the tech industry, but it's not coding. You could be that person. I mean, this is these are these are replicable results. The six figures was pretty amazing, but I mean, typically sixty to eighty thousand is what we see for a lot of people. So go to chooseify.com slash two nine seven to find out more about her story and what she did. And then for more information on that Salesforce opportunity, just go to chooseify.com slash Salesforce. Brad, go ahead. Back to you, man. I apologize in advance if I screw this up, but we're gonna hear from our uh, our buddy Josh Overmeyer. So give me a second here. Let's see. Oh, come on. Hey, Jonathan and Brad, what are some other podcasts do you follow or what are the other influencers do you follow? Oh, this is a great question, Brad. So I don't know if you have an order of operations, Brad. These are the, this is fun. Uh, so what podcast or influencers do you follow? So Brad, you are of, I, I know, a decent number of podcasters, but uh, you probably listen to more podcasts than uh, any other uh, podcast host that I know of. Who are the ones that inspire you the most? Yeah, that is a good question. Yeah, I do. I listen to a crazy number of podcasts. Like it's almost absurd, honestly. Um, I think the the ones that I like the most, I mean, my longtime favorite is the Tim Ferriss show. I think not, uh, you know, it's really as much for the guests as it is for, for Tim Ferriss himself. But he just, he does a really wonderful job interviewing people and he gets amazing guests on that are, really world-class performers at, at their different aspects of life. So, I mean, that, that jumps out to me. That's my longtime favorite. I'm a huge fan of, uh, Dr. Peter Atia. He has a podcast called the drive and he's just absolutely brilliant. I I'm always trying to find like these like next little, I don't know, little health hacks, uh, just to kind of stay healthy as much as I humanly can. I'm trying to, you know, obviously it's like the 80, 20 analysis of how do I, how do I still stay healthy? I actually found another podcast recently, uh, from, I think from Peter Tia, uh, called the Huberman lab. And this is a, a neuroscientist at Stanford. Uh, this guy, Andrew Huberman, I think his name is. And, uh, it's, uh, I just found out some like cool little sleep hacks, which were neat. And I'm trying to kind of help, help my daughter get to sleep earlier. She's now uh, 12 and going to sleep at, at, uh, midnight, which is always interesting. So yeah, we're trying to, you know, put some different kind of circadian rhythm thing. Anyway, long story short, that's not all that interesting, but, uh, but yeah, those, those jump out to me, I guess. Um, I'm a big fan of Naval Ravikant. So he, there's a podcast called the Naval the Naval show or just Naval, I think it is N A V A L. That is a fantastic little just set of, of short little philosophies. Basically he's a, a multi-time guest on the Tim Ferriss show. Uh, I'm just a huge fan of Naval. So yeah, I mean, Jonathan, without looking at my podcast app, because I'm afraid that I'm going to hang up this stereo. <laughs> um, that's what jumps out to me, but I'll, I'll try to brainstorm. What, what do you listen? Do you listen to anything? Uh, you, you know, I, I'm a lot of, I do a lot of tutorials these days. I'm very, you know me, I just like adding to my skill stack. So I, I, t I tend to look at more just trainings, online trainings, that sort of thing. So I spend a lot of time on, uh, on Skillshare and YouTube, uh, trying to up my skill stack. That that's like my preferred method. My one, uh, I guess dream guest or, uh, or a person that, uh, I just, uh, man, he just, I just, I just love him is, uh, Scott Adams. And he has his uh, YouTube thing called morning coffee with Scott that I, that I've really enjoyed recently. And so that's just kind of one thinker and he's kind of all over the place. He's not really latch him down, but his idea of, uh, the talent stack, uh, still sits with me to this day. I think he was the original one to talk about that. You introduced, uh, me to that idea that, you know, instead of being like world-class at like any one thing, which is probably really hard, you could just be like better than average at a bunch of different things. And you could make something completely, you know, you could make a skill set that's very high demand and very unique and, uh, kind of carve out your place. And that's kind of as someone that really identified with uh, mediocrity, uh, <laughs> in so many ways, that was something I was like, all right, I could do that. I could be a little bit better than average, right? I'm not, I'm not going to be Michael Phelps of anything, but I could be better than average at a bunch of different things. And yeah, I think it works. It's kind of allows you to start, uh, seeing opportunities where they, and make connections that maybe other people are not making. 
And so um, I give him a lot of credit for that. And I hope to reach out to him at some point, maybe even in the near future and, and have him come on the show and talk about uh, his, his, uh, his life, his life journey. I mean, I think the book that inspired the idea of talent stack was, and I'm going to miss say the title and I apologize ahead of time, but it was basically how to fail at nearly everything and still succeed. Am I close, Brad? And still win big. Yep. Still win big. Got it. Uh, and yeah, that's actually, I fail all the time, like all the time. And I remember when the fear of failure would keep me from starting something or trying something. And now truly mindset, I just, I understand and respect the fact that this is a process and failure is completely fine. And I try to use some rules around it. I try not, I try to fail in inexpensive ways. Uh, I try to fail in ways that don't demoralize me. And I try to look at those failures and figure out what could I have done better and iterate on that and be excited to get back at it. And um, that tiny little tweak and that shift of, you know, it's kind of that Thomas Edison. Oh, you know, you're such a failure. No, I know all these things that don't work. It's kind of, you kind of realize there's more truth there than, you know, it kind of felt like a platitude when you were a kid. Nobody likes to fail. And now you're like, no, it's like a truth for life. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, there's something definitely to that, right? Like if you're not failing, you're just kind of staying in your lane, right? Like, are you really trying hard enough? Are you trying hard enough to learn new things, right? Like almost invariably when you learn something new, you're going to fail, right? Like you're going to that first time is going to be pretty darn difficult, but it's how you pick back up and move forward from there. And, uh, Jonathan, I think you were answering one of our future questions that I think is going to come through here since I don't get to uh, get to select them, unfortunately, but, uh, about who would our, our dream podcast guest be. So I think, I think we're going to play that one here shortly. But, but yeah, we'll, um, we'll, we'll just have to see what's in the, what's in the uh, yeah. Russian roulette and the voicemail <laughs> well, machine, right? We'll answer that when we come to it. But uh, actually, uh, two other podcasts jumped up for me. So uh, Armchair Expert with, uh, with Dax Shepard, I think is one of, if not the best podcasts that exist. I think it is incredible. He is, you know, the actor, Dax Shepard from Parenthood. Super smart guy, really interesting. He's, you know, very emotionally open. He, he's a brilliant interviewer. That is, uh, that's my new favorite show. And I'm a big fan of, of the Prof G show, uh, Professor Scott Galloway from NYU. I'm just, I just like the guy. So uh, I enjoy listening to that. But yeah, that's in my very large stable of, of podcasts. So, all right, we're going to move on. on them. This is the thing. Like he actually stays up to date on all of these shows. Like there's no backlog. I don't know. I don't know how you, I don't know how you it's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of uh, <laughs> pathology at this point, but okay, we're gonna we're gonna move on here. Let's uh, let's see if I can kick up the next voicemail. I think one of the most Josh. impactful lessons I've learned from listening to your podcast for the past four years came from Jerry, the millionaire educator, back in season one, with his concept of earning your income and keeping as much as you can on your side of the ledger rather than Uncle Sam's. Sure, it's great to go out and find ways to keep increasing your income and changing jobs and all of this. The, the, helps expand your income earning potential. But if you always spend every dollar you make, you'll never be able to retire. You'll never reach financial independence. So there's that inherent need to focus on savings and not spending every dollar that you can that really supercharges your path to FI. All right. That was our, our buddy, Josh Overmeyer, who's a great friend of the FI community. He's, uh, yeah, I mean, to a large degree, Josh is the fight community. He's amazing. He's always at, at all the meetups, Jonathan. He's a just a remarkable guy. Yeah, and to his point, it's, gosh, it's one that stood out with me. I mean, really very early on. I remember, Brad, when we were talking about who was our dream guest to get on a show, when we started, like, what was one of the first names that said, we have to get Millionaire Educator on the show? He was episode 13. We'd only interviewed, so episode, you can go to chooseify.com slash 013. I think we'd only interviewed maybe one other person before talking to him. I was so excited to speak with him that I think it took 20 minutes for you to get a single question. And at the end of it, uh, you know, we were like, oh, that's a good interview. I was like, I mean, I wasn't in it, but I mean, yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> oh, that was so funny. Yeah. Way back. I think our first three interviews, I spoke for under one minute. That was uh... a <laughs> Was I was time. so nervous about silence. Like I was so nervous that we wouldn't have the next, like, I mean, you know, talk about failing and failing forward, Brad. I mean, we, we picked up podcasting in 2017 and you're like, there's this terrifying mic that you're looking into and you don't know what the next sentence is going to be. And you're like, ah, so just fill the, fill the space. There's, 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 there's
but yeah, Josh is, Josh is spot on with, you know, keeping it on your side of the ledger, just that mentality, right? I think, I, I know you have cited that dozens of times over the last four years as, as something that just really stuck out to you. And yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because yeah, the millionaire educator, I think was either our second or third guest, but people, I get emails every single week at our feedback at choose email address talking about that episode and how, oh, I'm a teacher and I heard that millionaire educator episode and now I get a paycheck that's $2 and 47 cents because I'm maxing out my 403B and my 457. And we saved $96,000 this year between myself and my spouse. You know, I, I get, I legitimately get those emails on a weekly basis. So that is unquestionably one of the most impactful episodes. I'm trying to remember now what exactly he was living off of because I know it was a badge of honor to them every single year to go into the HR department and have them come back and say, are you sure about that? Are you going to be okay? And um, the, the key is, I mean, they were able to, I believe it was either they were living off of, they had done some sort of like SEP 72T uh, or, or SEP or 72T distribution or he had money in his taxable accounts, Brad, that he was living off of. It was one of those two. But the key was when you were in the higher marginal tax brackets at 25, you know, 22, uh, 24% beyond, he was making sure all of that uh, would, would, would go into, in his case, he actually had access to two things. A lot of people don't realize this. And a lot of teachers, state employees have access to this. His 401k, so him and his wife, both teachers, he had access to his 401k. Let's just say it was 18,000 at the time. I know it's gone up since then, 19,000, 19,500. But let's just say it was 18,000 at the time. And his wife, 18,000, putting him at 36,000. And then he had access to another much uh, not as well-known tool called uh, the 403B. It was the 403B. And this is another account that is available for public employees, so state employees, but not limited to teachers. So a lot of firefighters, police officers, state employees have access to this. And it gives you another uh, some odd 18,000, 19,000. I think it matches the 401k limits. Yes, 19,500. 19,500. Okay, now. So uh, another, uh, again, just matching it back at the time we were talking with him, 18,000, right? So 18,000 with uh, with him and another 18,000 for his wife. They were putting at the time uh, somewhere around 72 plus thousand dollars a year because it was their side of the ledger. They were putting these in these pre-tax accounts. I mean, they just built a monster machine and, and they weren't making, I mean, they were making, I think they had basically looked and they had found out the rules inside of their teacher district where they could get additional certifications and get a guaranteed raise, teach a, uh, teach a, a sport or something like that, or do an extra, uh, you know, session or period or whatever, and be able to put on another 10%. They basically looked at all the rules and they maximized their income. And then they made sure they kept as much of it as possible. And there was one year where he was saying, we're on two teacher salaries with the public school system. And we're not talking about the college level or any high paid level. It's like what most people would think of as a forty to $50,000 a year job. And we, between the two of us, are saving over $100,000 a year because we just looked at the rules and we optimized. See, I'm much better at uh, silences now. <laughs> yeah, you don't feel <laughs> it. I like it. I'm very impressed. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a remarkable thing. And I think something you said in there is just knowing the rules. Right. I mean, I think that's one of the the through lines of what we picked up at the Phi community, you know, is is we all are trying to learn the rules of the game. And when you understand them, then you can look at it and say, OK, how can I how can I make this work for me? And this might be unusual, right? Like I might be the only person in the history of my school district that has gotten a $2 and 47 cent paycheck and the HR department might look at me like I'm crazy, but you know what? I just lowered my federal tax to zero and I saved 90 odd thousand dollars amongst the two of us. And we're going to retire at 45, right? Like just by knowing the rules, by knowing that that's an option, like millionaire educator in this case saved tens of thousands of dollars in tax basically every single year. And that's just a cool thing. And I mean, that is but one example of just knowing the rules 
it just sets you up for success. So yeah, I think that's a, a really, really critical lesson and something we should, we should, you know, reiterate Jonathan pretty often about just, and we, and we talk about that, like, okay, do you understand the rules? Do you understand where you are and how to move forward from here? All right, we're going to move along from there. I'm going to click it again, and we'll play a little roulette here, see what comes up, Jonathan, okay? This might be a little off topic, but I was wondering if you guys had any dream guests for the podcast and who that would be. All right, so we've had about five minutes to think about it, uh, and so I guess obviously I'll, I'll, I'll say I would like to reach out to Scott Adams and invite him on the show and it just needs to happen. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I am, I'm going to, I'm going to put that together and try and get him on the show this year in 2021. See, I'll do the best I can. Yeah. I think that should be very doable. I, mine would actually be uh, Mark Cuban. So I just heard him recently. I was uh, doing some research and uh, he was on a podcast called the quest in this pa- this past week or so. And I was stunned by the language that he used, which was, almost identical to Phi language. Like he, that's how he conceptualized saving money. He's before he sold broadcast.com for billions. He thought about how do I earn enough? So I have passive income that covers that covers all my expenses. It was really cool to see him talk about that. And, you know, I, I'm just fascinated by his entrepreneurial spirit. I think he's got some some cool things going, you know, Jonathan, obviously I'm not, uh, a dyed in the wool, uh, cryptocurrency fan by any means. I think that's, uh, it, the understatement of the century, but there is a lot of just fascinating new technology coming around with, uh, you know, he, these things called NFTs. It's these non fungible tokens. It's like basically digital art or digital videos that you can own. You have actual ownership and he's, his contention is, this is how Gen Z and beyond how they're going to collect things. And it's just so, and this is not the, the exact instance for this, but it's just fascinating to see new technologies come up and see someone like him who frankly, he doesn't need to learn this stuff. You know, he's worth billions upon billions of dollars. And yet he is at the forefront, the cutting edge of trying to figure out what is going to work. And I just find that I find that mindset so empowering. And I'd like to believe that I'm someone who's always looking to learn. Like I'm never resting on my laurels or getting stuck in some silly belief that, it, you know, has been, has been with me for years. Like if I'm ever at the point where I'm just stuck in some belief and I'm not willing to open my mind, like I feel like I've failed at life. And I think he is the perfect example of that open-minded really entrepreneurial spirit. So yeah, he's long story short, Mark Cuban, unquestionably. All right, there it is. We'll have to keep thinking about that list. You know, I think one thing that what stands out to me is um, who does our audience want us to have on this particular show? You know, like uh, to me, an audi- someone from the audience uh, telling us these are the, the people that I think would add a lot of value to the Fi community, as opposed to maybe a booking agent or someone else that's proactively just trying to get their person on everywhere. I, I really do want to know, like, who would you like to bump into the Fi community and hear, you know, some ideas uh, looked at through the lens of someone that's on the path to financial independence? Uh, and you know, you're not going to agree on everything. And I know we've tried this before and, and sometimes it's uh, it's an intense conversation and, and, but I mean, Paula tried it, you know, with Susie Orman a while back. And it was a, I think the, the community was better for hearing that clash of ideas. Uh, I'm just thinking who these, these individuals are and the ideas that are out there. Uh, there, there's a lot to choose from, but I think the Fi community is better when we like, you know, recognize that we don't all agree on the same thing. Uh, but to Brad's, uh, input, you know, point about being open-minded, it's there, there shouldn't be anything that you're like afraid to touch or go near. Um, it should be, how does this look through like a balanced lens of what my goal is, which is to, you know, reclaim my time and my bandwidth and be able to allocate that and, and be able to, you know, create a safe, uh, you know, financial future for myself and my family. So, uh, yeah, send us your ideas and, and, and who you'd like for us to, who you'd like for us to reach out to, and we can look into seeing whether or not that would be possible. All right, Brad, what do you got for us? All right. I don't know. It's roulette. So we're going to, uh, we're going to hit the button here. See next what comes up. Say, let's play the next one. Say you're on the fast track to Phi. say that's within 15 years and yeah. you want to start 
thinking about adding bonds to your portfolio. So say currently you're about halfway through and you're still 100% equities. When do you think is a good time to start adding bonds to your portfolio? I'm especially talking about the people that are pretty fast to FI, the, the people that are trying to get there within 10 to 15 years. And a little context, I am a young adult. So uh, kind of what are your thoughts on when to start adding bonds to your portfolio? Uh, would you say about once you're 75% of the way there? Is there a number that you should get to? Uh, just what are your thoughts? Man, this is a great question. And it's not one that I have... Um... I have like a prescriptive uh, answer for at this particular point in time. Um, I will just say that I plan on being at financial independence easily within 15 years and likely inside of 10. Uh, yeah, I'll be inside. I'll be at five within, within 10 years, very handily. And uh, at that point in time, uh, what would, at what point would I, cause I, right now I do not have anything in any, any bonds, any bonds at all right now. I have zero bonds. Um, I am trying to diversify my portfolio. And so I have, you know, a, a lot in, um, you know, index funds as we talk about. And, you know, there's some pivots there between whether it's cap weighted or whether it's, uh, you know, kind of being a little bit more diversified and having some in small cap and value. You've heard the conversations that we've had with Paul Merriman, uh, but largely it's, you know, we're looking at an equity based portfolio with no bonds. So at what point do you start getting more conservative and I, I think for me, it's probably more in terms of once the idea of, once I have a clear um, exit date in mind, I guess, you know, like inside, if I knew that I'm going to be needing to do drawdown inside a period of like five years, uh, personally, it's a personal answer. I'm just kind of sharing what my personal mentality is. I'm starting to think about what's going to derail that. And would a big event, you know, going into that last year, um, or right after, would that, would that scare me or terrify me? And then at that point I'm saying, you know, do I need as much growth for this last five years or do I need to have some sort of ballast in place, something to smooth the ride? So for me, it's kind of more of a, what's my plan post-retirement? Am I going to be earning income on the other side or is it just a transition to something else? And how far out till I'm planning on walking away from whatever that current form of income is? Um, though it's, it's, it's a combination of those two. And then as to the, uh, the actual percentage, I, you know, 60, 40 is that old traditional, um, kind of standard advice of 60% bonds and 40%, I'm sorry, 60% stocks and 40% bonds. It's a very personal choice. I think JL Collins says it the best. It's what allows you to sleep at night and, um, and just basically your risk tolerance. We could have that episode linked up as well. For me, I probably will not be quite that conservative, but what I might do is uh, something along the lines of 20 or 25%, you know, bonds or some sort of safer, uh, less volatile vehicle. And then I might, taking a look at what uh, Frank has talked about, I'm going to start really looking at um, what is the point of these? Am I looking for stability? Am I looking for income? Am I looking for negative correlation? Um, and I will probably start doing some research around that. So it might look like, you know, some sort of speculative investments for a small piece, maybe something in precious metals or in crypto or something like that for a small percentage. But that's, that's kind of just like a general uh, thought process. Uh, and again, the big points that I wanted to do here is I, I usually would say for me personally, if I know I'm going to be within about five years of my of my expected time of needing the money, that's when I'm pro I plan on starting to uh, be more conservative with my with my investments and starting to make some adjustments. Basically, planning out a glide path to my exit date. Brad, would you? I know yours looks a little different, but but you're farther on the path, so maybe you could have a different opinion from mine. Yeah, I will definitely go into that. Do you recollect that Big Earn talked about uh, paying off a mortgage? as a oh, potential yeah. alternative to bonds. That is a great point. Uh, and yeah, well said, let me find the episode while you kind of talk about your strategy and then I'll, 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 I'll give you that number. Cool. Cause yeah, I think that's, uh, that's really important information that could definitely help. So, cause right. Mine is just going to be kind of an anecdotal answer, which is, you know, obviously this is a great question. I personally am not stepping off of the, 
the equities gas pedal, let's say, even though I'm at financial independence, I personally do not have any allocation in bonds whatsoever. So uh, for me, I don't know, like there's not some prescribed amount. There's not like these are the rules or like you said, you know, the traditional amount is 60, 40. I think, you know, people, it's going to be individual preference and it's going to depend on your timeline. You know, I know you said you are a quote unquote young adult. So, you know, that suggests to me that you are, you know, maybe in your twenties is what I'm kind of guessing. And you're talking about a fast track of, of 10 to 15 years. Uh, you have a really long time horizon. So I'm not sure that I would personally, and this again is not, you know, exact advice for your situation, but like, would I, I'm looking at what's the highest likelihood of maximizing my net worth and making sure that this lasts me throughout my life. And I think for me, equities are, is where I personally, where I would choose. So I'm not sure that I would put any, any significant amount in bonds. You know, that said, Jonathan, to your point, there are other options. That doesn't mean I'm not looking for, you know, if I had something that could guarantee, you know, and, and I use that very loosely because it's, it's not, not possible in 99% of cases, but if there was all of a sudden an, a bank that paid a guaranteed interest rate of 5% or something, which amazingly enough was the actual case when I graduated college, which, uh, which dates me quite a bit, but, uh, online banks paid 5% at that point. So, you know, if we got into some crazy environment where that came back, I mean, that's not too shabby, right. To guarantee that, especially when, you know, I need a 4% safe withdrawal rate and I'm guaranteeing myself five, you know, if, if I could absolutely lock in a 30 year guaranteed 5%, yeah, I might consider that for, for some, some percentage of my, my net worth. But again, I'm, I'm just kind of setting up like a funny example of like how I would approach this mentally. Cause I think that's really the answer is we're not going to be able to give you an answer for every single situation you face, but how do you think about the problem? So, I mean, that's, that's roughly how I would think about it. Well, you dropped a lot in there. I think it's really important to actually structure that a little bit in terms of like, what are the variables to consider? Um, and I think there's, it's probably worth pointing out a few, th like a few things came to mind. So one, first and foremost, bigger, and I think it's going to be episode uh, 152R was another, was another good one we had with Big Earn, uh, chooseify.com slash 152R. And then let me give you guys a couple more here find them all, uh, episode 66. So, so choose fi.com slash zero six, six. I think these are the two it's choose fi.com slash zero six, six, the emergency fund. Is it a bad idea? I think he talked about the glide path at the end and then choose fi.com slash zero three, five sequence of return risk for early retirees. Those are both the, the two big ones. Um, all right. Now going back to this, the, the, the thing that Brad just said, uh, creating your glide path, you know, if you can decrease massively the, the your structural expenses at the point of retirement, what that tradition, what what I would say that would mean is you could treat that in some part like having bonds. That's what bigger. That's a case that bigger and was making. It's that would act as a substitute for having a hefty amount of bonds because the actual structural costs of your life are so much less because you don't have a fifteen hundred dollar mortgage, a two thousand dollar mortgage, a three thousand dollar mortgage because that's gone. Uh, that is a structural expense that's gone. And now the bonds that you would need to make sure you always had to cover that may not need to be there. Um, bonds are not very attractive right now, right? I mean, the, the, they just haven't been super attractive for, for several years. And so I think all of us are kind of like, oh, you know, what else, what else could I do? Um, and, and people look at it different ways. Some people just end up having a big cash cushion, you know? So like, Hey, I may not have any bonds, but I have two years in cash. So if it hits the fan, I'm good for the next couple of years, regardless. Is that the most efficient way of doing it? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, big earn would say, absolutely not. It's a huge cash drag. Um, other people like Brad, like to Brad's point. So one on the other end of financial independence, you created multiple kind of relatively until choose a fi at least it was relatively passive income businesses that didn't take. So that's, that's another thing that a lot of people are doing and they have income on the other side. Really what uh, reaching financial independence meant is they stopped working for a corporate, right? They were, they were just done with corporate work. They were just doing their own thing. Maybe it's something that they wanted to pick up and that starving artist syndrome really kept them from pursuing it. Now they're creating 
for the love of creating and they earn income on the other side. Or if that, I mean, that massively changes your risk tolerance, you know, and, and what sort of allocation you need if you're going to be earning even any sort of income on the other side. And uh, a couple other things that you could add uh, onto this just, just to balance it out is how much flexibility do you have in there? So Big Earn likes to kind of say, well, you're going to need to be more flexible than you think. But I think it's worth pointing out that a someone right, someone that's hard, like pursuing financial independence aggressively, thinking they're going to hit it in 15 years on this side, of, you know, on the left side of 40, uh, they have a lot more runway than someone that's just eking out financial independence at the age of 67 while accounting for social security. They're just barely hit their number. And as long as nothing breaks, you know, it's going to be fine. They don't have as much flexibility in that plan as the individual that, yeah, they could work. They could earn more. They could go back if they needed to. Uh, and you, and I know that there used to be the old, you know, like, well, you know, you can't get jobs during a pandemic, you know, or what do you, what type of job are you going to get? Well, that's been proven because we had a perfect case study this past year that if you're, we had individuals that lost jobs making 35, retrained, we just talked about the Guinness this episode, into jobs paying 60 to 80, right? That is a perfect case study for the fact that like if you have good information and you can act on it, you can get a job that pays more than it pays right now in the worst of worst times. Um, and so, you know, your degree to w be willing to be flexible if something were to come at you and you're, you're willing to accept that that is a possibility, you know, is is that work? Because the other, the counterpoint comes to the cost too. You being too heavily weighted toward bonds may mean that you're working one year, two year, five years longer than you need to work. It's not like just going to bonds locks in the date that you want. You could have been there multiple years sooner. How much is that security of knowing, how much of your life is it worth to have that? Uh, that's kind of like the, the, the value judgment that you have to play. And Brad, to your point, like I know you're a little, uh, you like you like your cash a little bit more than I do. And on my end, I did say bonds as this theoretical thing that I'm going to have to grapple with as I get closer. But I can tell you right now, I don't look at bonds and say, "Woo, I wish I had more of those. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's you got it. You got to make a decision based on the variables at your disposal at a particular point in time, knowing kind of what you want on the other side. Yeah, agreed. It's uh, just like anything. It's personal finance is truly personal and you need to figure out where you're coming from. I know that sounds kind of uh, cliche, but it really, it really is true. There are things that are like we always say here, there are things that may be more mathematically optimal, but if you don't sleep well at night, is that really the right decision for you? And for me, I, I very strongly factor in that. Do I sleep well at night? test. It just, it matters for me. So I, I will say though, one thing, I, oh, no, one more, I, one more, I will say though, I want, I, you said it and I, I realized I, I, before I walk away and I go into drawdown, I have decided like I am going to pay off my mortgage. Like I know that 100% before I'm actually technically drawing down a dollar, you know, before I'm in, in that place, I want that structural expense gone. Many people are happy writing it out through drawdown, but for me personally, I'm not going to pay it off early now. I'm going to let my equities roll. Uh, but when I get close to that retirement date, I'm going to get rid of that mortgage and get that structural expense off of my books. And that changes, that massively changes the calculation of what your fine number is and needs to be on the other side. Yeah. I mean, it's a, obviously a massive, massive expense every single month. So yeah, it's huge. And actually big earn. So in on early retirement now.com, he has the, the famous safe withdrawal rate series. And, uh, part 21 is why we will not have a mortgage in early retirement. So I think that that answers the question. And Jonathan, that also goes with, with your thought of, Hey, it's just not going to be part of my five plan. So yeah, that's uh, that. Thank you for the questions, and Jonathan, I think we're gonna gonna wrap this up for now. All right, all right, everybody. So we we worked through a uh, few uh, road bumps this week, and we appreciate your patience. Those of you that, that hung on with us, we hope you got value from it. We are planning on doing this for the next ten weeks. Uh, we'll be coming to you live, so you guys don't need to tune in this Friday, right? You can just skip that episode because uh, we're going to be airing this for the larger Choose by community. But if you'd like to interact with us, you'd like to hear us put it together live with all of our train wrecks and car crashes, uh, we would love for you to consider joining us as it works for your schedule and uh, just send us your voicemails and we'll keep getting better at this, keep dialing it up, keep being more fun. Um, so thank you uh, for just participating in this and the fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.
All right, Brad. Well, we we survived. It's our it was our first kind of live radio show esque event. I keep waiting for someone to say first time caller, long time listener, and Josh kind of <laughs> gave us a little bit of that. Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to continue to uh, dial up the interaction and the engagement on these events. But because I, I think like there, if if the que- if the conversation is limited by our questions. Uh, we're gonna have blind spots, you know, and and I, the heart of this was always what is the community grappling with? What is the nuance that they 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 want to get some input or insight on? And and you know, while you, it's really hard to give personalized uh, advice, you can certainly take the framework of what they're giving you and kind of expand on it. What what how would you look at the variables and what direction would you move in with those variables in mind? So uh, yeah, with that in mind, we hope that you will join us next week and uh, let us know what's stopping you from reaching financial independence or just, you know, what is a question that you've had that you haven't been able to get a great answer on and you want to bring it to us. We might not know the answer, but then that provides us a great uh, insight as to what information we really need to bring to this community and we can track down experts and do that. So take us up on the invitation, go to chooseify.com slash live. Hello, friend. The fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.